Kal tara. No 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 čoki. No. 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 Čok sada dvije se moni moj.
Welcome back, I'm Kim, this is Del, and we are Going the Whole Hog. We make travel films and write accompanying guides over on our blog, goingthewholehog.com. This Tuschetti to Pankissi trek was one of many that we did in Georgia's Cox's Mountains in the summer of 2020. If you fancy doing the same trek yourself, we've written a very detailed guide covering absolutely everything that you need to know, and you'll find that on our blog. You can find it by clicking the link up here. For now, we will just go into a few more details about the trek itself and tell you a bit more about our own experience on it. This trek connects Omalo in the remote highland area of Tusheti with the lowland area of Pankissi Valley in northeastern Georgia. It takes five days and it's about 88 kilometres. You spend one night in a guest house and three nights camping or one of those nights could be in a tourist shelter. There's some river crossings to deal with and there's potential for a lot of aggressive sheepdogs in this area. And there's also very limited water on some of the days, so you do have to carry quite a lot with you. For these reasons, we'd recommend this really just for experienced hikers. The best hiking season is from July to August, although it's possible to do it slightly before or after, maybe mid-June and into September, but it really depends on the conditions. We hadn't actually originally planned on doing this trek, it wasn't even on our radar whatsoever. It was a bit of a last minute decision once we were actually in Omalo and Tusheti. We had always wanted to go to Pankissi Valley and to Nazi's guest house in particular, after I read about it on our friend Emily's uh, blog wanderlush.org. And when we were looking at the maps and things and deciding how to get there, it dawned on us that it was actually possible to walk there. So instead of doing the notorious and exciting road to get back down to the lowlands, we decided just to give it a go and see if we could plan a route and walk there. We had a little bit of information that we'd managed to piece together from a couple of different sites, enough that we could see where we were meant to be going, we could tell where we could get water and the places that we should be camping. We didn't have as much info as we normally would, so that made it um, a little bit nerve-wracking for us setting off. There was uh, a few more surprises along the way, but we decided to just go for it and challenge ourselves and see how it turned out. Day one for us was from Geli Meadow to Jarbaselli via the Nakaicho Pass. It was 19 kilometers. There was a total elevation gain of over 1,100 meters and an elevation loss of over 1,500 metres. We estimated it would take the average hiker between six to eight hours to complete this distance. It took us 11 hours. Uh, as you know, if you've watched any of our videos, we're on the slower side, plus lots of filming, taking pictures, breaks, taking notes, etc. We chose to hike along the ridge for day one of this trek, but you could actually drive straight to Jarbaselli, where we stayed in the guest house, or hike along the Gomatsari Gorge instead if you don't fancy doing the ridge hike. Um, it's very scenic though, we would recommend it. We hired a car just to take us from Obalo, where we were staying in a guest house, to Geli Meadow, where that trek starts. We'd already walked that part as part of the Chatilly to Obalo hike, so we didn't want to do it again. We paid 50 lari and it took about 20 minutes to drive us there and drop us off to start the hike. I had a backpack full of water because we knew that there was nowhere to get water until 16 kilometers in at uh, Daddy Carta village, which is almost near the end. So I think I probably had about five liters of water in my bag or something like that. Yeah. It was heavy. <laughs> uh, the start of the trek, uh, start of the day going up to the ridge is quite a bit of a climb, although it's nothing too steep, but just fairly gradual, but it's, it's quite a big change in elevation. Once you get up to the ridge, there's fantastic views. Uh, either side indeed all around. Um, it was a bit of an atmospheric day with cloudy skies but we did get to see some fantastic views of the villages that we'd hiked through before. Yeah and, so you look down yeah. to the right to Perikitis Valley and over to the left is the Gomatsari Gorge so it's a really great vantage point. Mm -hmm. Yeah and we saw about eight birds of prey that mm -hmm. were like circling around us at the top that was amazing. Uh, I don't think Del was quick enough to capture them on video, unfortunately, but I did get some on my phone if you want to check out our Instagram story highlights that are on there. And I did manage to snap a couple of pictures as well. I'm not sure exactly how they turned out, but maybe we can pop them up. If they're any good, I'll pop them on the screen for you. If there's nothing appearing right now, you'll know that they were rubbish. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we um, undulated along the ridge after getting to the top and you know encountered a few sheepdogs here and there, gave them a wide berth as usual. And yeah, it was just a really nice walk with amazing views. I had a picnic at the pass 
and then it was time for us to start descending down into the Gomatsari Gorge, which was a pretty big descent, over 1500 metres down. Um, some sections were steeper than others, but on the whole, it was mostly okay. Mm -hmm. There's some handy way marking poles that you can just aim for as long as you've got good visibility, and that kind of keeps you on track, so that was pretty good. And um, got down to the three little streams, which you have to sort of keep crossing in quick succession uh, near the bottom, some forest section, which was really nice, just before turning the corner and getting this amazing view of the tower at Varkovani. And then we carried on into Jorbaselli village, where we were hoping we could get a guest house for the night. Um, last summer, we had a bit of trouble kind of getting in touch with guest houses in advance to check if they were open or not. So we were kind of winging it a bit. And thankfully we found Pusholi guest house, which was fairly new and yeah, really nice place to stay. And they had a puppy. Always good in my books. Yeah, uh, nice place to stay, good food, and very welcoming hosts. Day two was Jarbaselli to the Alas Nastavi tourist shelter. It was a long day at 21 kilometers, and there was over 1,600 meters of elevation gain and more than 1,300 meters of elevation loss, so a lot of up and down. We estimated it would take a hiker between seven to nine hours to complete this part of the trek. For us, it was a 12 and a half hour day. <laughs> yeah, it was a big day that started off going quite well and turned into tricky trail and various dramas and got in at sunset. So yeah, it was a biggie. Mm -hmm. um, the first hurdle that we had to cross was the river at Jorbaselli, which used to have a bridge but no longer has one, it got destroyed. But we were thankful that our guest house owner um, drove us across, so that was great. And yeah, the first part of the day is really quite nice, the trail's good, you're climbing a bit and um, yeah, it was pretty easy, saw some horses, they were nice, great views, and it was all pretty straightforward. Oh, saw some bear prints along the way. Very, very fresh bear prints. I was like, Del, what do you reckon those are? Because I know what I think they are, and he's just like, oh, I don't know, a big dog? And I'm like, that's not a dog, that's definitely bear prints. We have heard that bears here are generally quite shy and will just we... run away into the forest if they see you. Yeah, we took pictures of it. And um, we later showed it to Nazi at Nazi's guest house where we ended up and she confirmed that it was definitely bear prints. Definitely bear prints. Anyway, start of the day, it was really nice, straightforward trail, all going well. And then we hit a fork in the trail where initially we actually went the wrong way and ended up doing an extra couple of kilometers, uh, had to come back. And when we continued on the right fork, also the right fork, uh, the trail kind of descended into like this overgrown mess. There was stabby plants, bushes, hogweed, all that usual stuff. A little narrow trail that you keep kind of like tripping yourself up on and slowed the pace down a lot. I, I was like feeling really confident. I was like, Del, we are going like the clappers here. We're going to be fine. And yeah, then we got back to our usual slow pace. And then we hit the landslide area. Oh, the landslide area. So actually we didn't really film this section because it was a bit too tricky mm -hmm. and um, it was quite wide, the trail you could see going across it and Del decided to go up the left. And once he got over, I said to him, oh, there's another trail going up the right, am I okay to go that way? And he's like, yeah, yeah, you're fine. I went that way. Turned out it was extremely steep and there was a huge drop off on the other side. I was like on my hands and knees trying to get up it. And the position I was in, my backpack basically like pinned my head to the ground and I was wearing my wide brimmed hat and I couldn't see anything. And I had like zero field of vision and just like freaked out and couldn't move. And I'm like screaming on him to come and get me. And uh, he had to come and rescue me, drag me up, haul me up out from that bit. So after that, my nerves were shot a little bit. I just sort of sat there and had a wee cry and uh, got my composure back and uh, had to had to get over that little moment, then tackle another couple of landslides and eventually calm my nerves with a whole load of cheese at the Alasnastavi cheese farmers, thankfully. Got invited in by the farmers there. They produce cheese in the traditional way, which is inside like sheep, is it stomach? Stomach lining, I think. I think Maybe. so. Maybe I'm getting confused with, you know, our old Scottish haggis. But anyway, it's like sheep skin, which is turned inwards so that the hair is facing inwards and they make all oh, the so cheese in there. Oh, so not stomach lining then. The actual a skin, oh, yeah, okay. the skin. If there's yeah, there's no hair in the stomach, is there? So <laughs> there might be a skin. Um, yeah, so they make all these different types of cheese. They've like won awards for it and so on. They just live out there all summer, mm. and uh, that was great. So they invited us in and showed us all around their the cheese farm, and um, we got to taste 
three or four different varieties, all mm-hmm. of which were delicious. And they packed us off with some cheese as well, which he was moaning about because of all the weight uh, being added. I was like, let's just eat it then, come on. Um, I was also worried about our time, you know, because yeah. we were spending time there, it was getting late in the day. I think it was already about six o'clock or something. Yeah. yeah, it was getting towards that. Anyway, we thanked them, we managed to move on, and the last section took us about three hours to get to the tourist shelter. The reason for that was there are a lot of landslide areas again to negotiate alongside the river. Sometimes you have to go up, sometimes you skirt alongside the river, and we made a couple of wrong turns again, so it took us a while. It was basically getting dark as we were approaching the the tourist shelter, which we expected to be completely empty, um, and we just had some bad luck, and it turned out there was a whole group coming the opposite way from Pankisi who had gotten there, and there was no room in the shelter. All of our dreams of an easy night without having to put up the tent and being able to use the lovely toilet there and the flowing water were shattered and we had to put the tent up and the toilet was broken and we had to cook outside and all that normal stuff. So uh, that was a bit of a, a bit of a downer at the end of a, a very long day, 12 and a half hours and didn't get the best sleep that night because the group were chatting outside till, I don't know, one in the morning or something like that. So wasn't the best. We should have, in hindsight, camped a little bit further on, but we were just too exhausted by the time we got there. So that was that. Day three was the Alasna Stabi tourist shelter to Masara Shepherd Camp via the Socorro Pass. It was 13 kilometers. There was a total elevation gain of over 1,500 meters and an elevation loss of around 1,100 meters. We estimate this would take a hiker about seven to 10 hours to complete. It took us 14 hours in the end. <laughs> The longest day of the trek yet so we always knew this was going to be a big day we had not as much distance to cover but big elevation gain and loss a pass to cross uh, limited water spots and we were expecting heavy rain towards the end of the day so we knew this was going to be a biggie we got up early tried to leave as early as possible the first part of it was fine it's just along the river and then the climb up to Socorno Pass was um, pretty nice amazing views we met a shepherd on horseback who was going up there to make a phone call because apparently that's the only place you could get a phone reception that was about a three hour round trip for him I think yeah something like that yeah um, but yeah, the, the river crossing before the pass was absolutely no problem. We just kind of splashed through that. And yeah, by the time we got to the top of the pass, it had completely misted over. It was quite atmospheric. Um, had some lunch and then we were glad that we had GPS to follow. Otherwise, we wouldn't have had a clue where we were going. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was that misty. Um, not long after leaving the top of the pass, we hit that very hairy landslide section um that seemed to just be the theme of this trek it was like really bad landslides mm-hmm. that were pretty treacherous to cross this was definitely the worst one of the lot yeah it took us a while to negotiate uh, it was quite difficult for me to go down with a heavy bag on yeah it maybe didn't look that steep in the video but trust me it was very steep and the the loose stones were just completely falling away underneath our feet or our bums or whatever we were going down on and there was a huge drop um, where everything was just flying off. So it was pretty hairy for me to watch him trying to get across. And I don't even know how hard that must have been for you with 25 kilograms on your back. I could feel the whole weight pushing me down and I was very conscious about the, the small stones sliding out from under my feet. Uh, so I was just kind of hugging the ground as much as possible. Once I got down that little steep corner, it was okay to get across. I dumped my bag and then came back to get Kim, which is what you saw in the video. Yeah, so he carried my bag across while I just tried to negotiate it. Uh, Yeah, that was not fun. And again, the adrenaline keeps you going while you're doing it. And then you get to the other side and you're like, okay, breathe and hope that there's no more of that to deal with, which there wasn't. Uh, But the further down that we got, I was looking across the valley and suddenly spotted the trail that we had to go up once we got to the bottom uh, and climb up the other side. And I was like, are you kidding? It looked impossibly steep and At that point, I was thinking, absolutely no way. We are stopping early. There's no way we're climbing to the top of that today. We'll just sack this and find somewhere to camp at the bottom. It took us a while to get down to the river in the end Mm. because there was tons of overgrown hogweeds and bushes and, again, a narrow little trail that you're just tripping over your own feet if the rhododendrons aren't trying to trip you up. And, yeah, it took us a while to get down to the very bottom, to the river, at which point we realised... There was no good place to camp. Mm -hmm. Uh, It was a very narrow river canyon, basically. There was a small patch of stones that we could have camped on technically, but with a thunderstorm coming, 
that was not safe at all. If the water levels had risen, we would have been uh, scuppered. At this point, it was about half past four and the thunderstorm was due within the hour. Mm. And I was just thinking, oh man, I've got to get up that other side. We need to engage some serious concentration and uh, effort at this point. Which is what we did and what Kim did, she just pushed on um, pretty much without stopping from the river up to that next stream where there was a bit of uh, ice covering it still. Yeah, it was so steep, it looked steeper from across the valley to be fair. It wasn't as bad when we were on it but it was just like steep switchbacks all the way up. I looked like I was going quite slow in the video actually but I feel like I was really like challenging myself. I didn't stop once, I just ignored him, kept in a zone, was like doing some sort of weird breathing technique. Um, and Rather yeah. than slow, I would say you were steady, steady. and there was no stopping. So you can actually cover quite a fair bit of distance if you just go steadily and don't stop. Is that, is that right? That is, that is right. I'll need to bear that in mind. Anyway, I think the last clip we had in the video was crossing that stream, then almost immediately afterwards, the thunder and lightning started, the rain started coming yeah. on heavy, so the cameras went away, waterproofs got on, and then it was about another hour of climbing still to get up to the shepherd camp area where we were hoping to camp. Yeah, so that was the first bit of uh, flat ground where it was suitable and possible to camp, and there was also a water source there. Uh, we were met by the shepherd, came like running down the hillside. Uh, you couldn't even see his camp actually from where we were. It was hidden sort of behind a little hillock. He basically just like gestured us over into his camp, which was, essentially like a tarpaulin lean-to. Um, he had the fire going in there, it was completely smoked out, we were like choking and everything in there, but yeah, he made us a hot drink. And at that point, the rain had stopped and we really just needed to get the tent set up and get out for soaking wet clothes. I realized that my phone had been in like a little Ziploc bag in my waterproof jacket pocket and had gotten waterlogged somehow. So my phone wasn't working, it wasn't responding. That was not good news because I had most of our mapping apps and things like that. Long story short, the shepherd wanted us to stay in his like little lean-to camp. Um, we just wanted to put the tent up because it's much drier, warmer, less awkward for us. It was just like a muddy ground. There wasn't really room for the three of us to be sleeping in there and really needed to change every single thing that I was wearing. So we, we just set up our tent a little bit further down the hill away from him. Then the nightmare ensued that was his dogs. They returned from the top of the hill uh, when the flock came back at night and they basically just had us under siege for about two or three hours that night in the dark, surrounding the tent, barking like mad, growling. One of them attacked the tent at one point. Uh, we were basically held hostage inside the tent. Couldn't cook any food. We just had, what was it, a 14 hour day? Ridiculous. A 12 hour day before that, an 11 hour day before that. It was the end of a very long three days. And yeah, we couldn't, it wasn't safe for us to cook food. Uh, we were just having to munch on some dry food. Every time we moved inside the tent, the dogs would start up again. Uh, couldn't get out to go to the toilet. And the shepherd was shouting on the dogs, sort of, but I'm not sure if either he didn't really have control over them or whether we'd offended him by not accepting his hospitality and sleeping in the hut with him. Um, but either way, we had a pretty horrible two to three hours in the tent in the dark with some ferocious dogs surrounding us and barking like mad. Of course you saw none of that um, <laughs> because we weren't really in a position to be filming anything. We were just concerned for getting the tent up, getting inside the tent and our own safety. The dogs actually came at us while I was still in the process of putting the tent fly on. Uh, Kim was inside yeah. getting changed. I was standing outside in the wind for a, a good hour. Shivering, you know, our clothes were like soaking wet and Shining my head torch in the eyes of these point. dogs that were surrounding me and waving my pole and whatnot until I decided just to get in as well. Um, but there it was, it was quite a trying experience. Yeah, and we were just starving after and we such were a long day. And we were exhausted, so yeah, properly exhausted. not being able to eat properly as well just compounded things for the next day. Yes. So, day four. Masada Shepherd Camp to Mountain Spring Camp. It was 12 kilometers. It was about 800 meters up and about 900 meters down. We estimated it would take about four to six hours to complete this section of the trek. It took us about eight and a half hours. 
our morning started with more dogs. They were back as soon as the sun was up, mm. surrounding the tent. Anytime we made a little bit of noise, they would just go off on one. And so we had to try and pack up everything inside the tent. I mean, it was just an absolute bomb site, basically. Everything everywhere. A nightmare for him trying to get everything in the tent and yeah. So well, this is basically <laughs> what you saw in the um, in the video. Yeah. You know, it cut from us walking up the, the day before to that morning show. Yeah, so we'd been through a lot in the in-between point. Mm. Uh, they surrounded us again for about two hours in the morning. We couldn't get out of the tent or do anything and eventually they left with the flock uh, about seven in the morning or something and we could get out and just got packed up as soon as possible so that we could move on and get out of their territory. There is a spring next to the shepherd's camp so we filled up there because we knew there was no more water until our, our next camp that afternoon. Hightailed it out of there and in the end we were able to have the previous night's dinner for our breakfast which was a very welcome feast one of our dehydrated meals that we had we were just pretty broken at that point so tired after three long trekking days hardly any sleep the stress of the dog sedent that day i would say and the section after that which unfortunately we didn't even manage to show you much of um was probably one of the most scenic spots mm -hmm. and we were having a constant battle with ourselves of wow, this is amazing, we really want to enjoy this and we really want to film loads of it to show you guys. But we were just so exhausted and we knew more rain was coming that afternoon so we didn't want to like kind of mess around too much and waste too much time. This part of the trek was also the one that we had least amount of information about. We had one source of info which was a little bit outdated and we didn't really know exactly what lay ahead in terms of the terrain and, and so on. So. We didn't really want to risk it, we were just like, let's keep going. And we hit the Iron Mountain Trail, where you were mostly just doing a bit of handheld mm -hmm. footage of me. Um, it was a bit of a narrow trail going along like the side of the mountain, kind of kept crisscrossing back, um, back and forth. Again, very scenic, but the weather had started to, to kind of close in by that point and eventually the rain came back and we had to don the waterproofs one more time uh, for the final, the final stretch into our camp for that evening. Yeah, so just going back to the kind of Iron Mountain section and before that, we did consider flying the drone there, but oh, the yeah. conditions were quite windy at that time. Um, we were conscious that I hadn't flown the drone since day one, but we'd just not been able to because of time constraints and the long days and it had just gotten away from us. Um, Wind, you've only got three batteries as well, so mm. you always have to be like thinking, where do we want to use these batteries? And then dogs as well. We've realised that dogs really don't like the drone. They don't like the sound. We become a target for them. You know, you, you might not even realise there's dogs there and suddenly they're on you uh, when the noise comes up. So There were no dogs on this day, yeah. but it was just a case of it was windy and I was just extremely tired as well. Which... Did you notice that perfect timing? We started talking about dogs and Emma, Emma. our neighbour's dog, started, started going off on one. She must, she must know something. We'll just give Emma a minute to calm down. So in the end, we didn't get as much drone footage of this trek as we would have liked, but those were the reasons why. Yeah. So we made it to Mountain Spring Camp uh, about four o'clock in the afternoon, and we were just so relieved to be finishing earlier than sunset for a change. Um, the rain was due, so we just got the tent set up. There was a mountain spring, obviously, nearby, so it was a pleasure to have a water source at our camp for a change. And yeah, we were just so delighted to be stopping at four o'clock mm. and having a little bit of a rest. We had some, some great views from up there in between the kind of cloudy weather. There was a little bit of a hairy moment when I turned around and saw another five or six shepherd dogs just like standing there staring at us. And I was like, oh, you are kidding. Uh, but they just kind of had a bit of a stare off with us and the, there, there was we no, were there were maybe, no animals with them. There was no sheep. Yeah, they, they might have been. They might have been with cows. I don't know. And they tend to be less aggressive. I think their flock was down the hillside, and they just maybe sensed some people at the the camp and come up to have a little bit of a nosy. But thankfully, they left us alone, and we didn't have under siege two incident. The rain came on. We had to do some cooking in like the porch area of the tent for the first time ever and we were being super careful not to you know have any like hazards or fire damage or anything like that finished cooking and then Dell zipped up the tent but the burner was still warm and like immediately burnt through a hole in the tent 
sent fly. He was raging. He was totally like kicking himself. That happened, but thankfully yeah. the tent is very fire retardant and it just sort of fizzled out and that was that. Yeah, taped it up, no problem. <laughs> Day five was from our mountain spring camp to the village of Jokolo in Pankisi Valley. It was a total of 22 kilometers, um, only 200 meters up, but over 2000 meters down. Um, we estimated it would take between four and six hours to complete this. It took us about eight in the end, I think it was. So this morning we woke up to again a little bit of mixed weather um, but when the views cleared it was absolutely spectacular. Mm. Some sort of crazy clouds going on and some beautiful light and yeah amazing views from there and we were in general feeling a lot more positive about things after we'd had a good sleep. Mm -hmm. We didn't really know how far we had to go this day. We knew that the road started after about six kilometers, mm -hmm. but we weren't sure how busy that road might be, if there was going to be the possibility of hitchhiking the rest of the route or not. Uh, in the end, carried on the lovely trail, passed Tibetana Mountain, uh, descended down on the path and made it to Sakisto Lake where the road started. At that point, we fancied having a little break, you know, having a nice wee snack, taking in the views, but of course, sheepdogs. They ruined all of that for us. We saw a sign for another trekking route to Kadori village and, and getting to Pankisi Valley that way, which sounded quite interesting, but we had no information about that whatsoever. So we decided to just play it safe and stick to the route that we knew about. Um, but that could be a, an interesting one, um, an alternative route, if we can find out about, more about that. I think it goes past a waterfall maybe. Mm -hmm. Um, and it became very clear that there was definitely going to be no traffic. We were not going to be hitchhiking. So we had a pretty big descent. I think it was about 1300 meters uh, on a road descending down to Pankisi Valley, which sits at about 700 meters. So it was getting hotter and hotter and sweatier as we went. It was going through a forest mostly, but somehow there was zero shade and yeah, it was it was sticky, hot and energy zapping and I think one car did pass us and offered us a lift but they were going the wrong way. Yeah, we were, <laughs> we'd stopped by the side of the, the road to have some lunch so they didn't know which direction we were going yeah. in. Yeah. And unfortunately they were going up and we were going down so mm. we just had to keep, keep on walking and we were so glad when we got to that beautiful cold uh, river where we could just take our boots off and rest our weedy feet for a bit. Have a little, have a little refreshing dip. Yeah, and not then, long after that, you're going through the Batsara Nature Reserve where there's all the old yew trees. Yeah, or the outskirts of it. The anyway. outskirts of it, and then um, before long, we were on the the road that runs through Pankisi Valley itself, getting past the first small villages, yeah. and soon after we managed to hitch a ride to Jokolo. Yeah. So uh, yeah, a couple of guys stopped with us. We'd for us, we'd actually seen them earlier. They were picnicking up uh, in the forest and then they stopped and picked us up and immediately knew tourists, Pankesi, they'll be at Nazi's. So we got dropped off at Nazi's guest house and we were relieved, I would say, after this challenging trek with some really long days and yeah, it's put us out of our comfort zone a few times, I would say. We were just very relieved to get there. Nazi's guest house is wonderful and it's a reason to go to Pankesi anyway it's a, a beautiful old house hospitality is amazing the food is amazing mm -hmm. and nazi's basically been behind the entire building of a tourism network in pankesi she's really built that from the bottom up and it's it's amazing to see so i think we spent four nights there in the end we did yeah, yeah. monday to friday i think it was resting and having a wander around pankesi visiting various villages and yeah, just getting our energy back up and feasting on the delicious, delicious um, Chechen food there. Way too much food we had <laughs> in the end, but it was great. Yeah, so we 100% recommend staying at Nazi's guest house if you're um, planning to do this trek or if you just fancy visiting Pankisi Valley on its own. Mm -hmm. And she also organises horse treks of the region. So you could actually do the route that we did on horseback with um, a guide and camping along the way and so on. Um, so yeah, you can check out her website or um, ask her about hiking and um, horseback tours that she organises there. As we said before, we would consider this a trek that is really only suitable for experienced hikers. You know, there's challenging terrain, there's some long days, limited water sources, limited places to camp, 
um, and a remote area. So you definitely need to be fully self-sufficient and confident in your abilities. We've got some suggested packing lists for things like uh, food, clothing, camping gear and so on in the blog post which is on the website uh, specifically for this hike. We've also got a couple of other blog posts that, where we've outlined all of our camping gear that we have, all of our hiking gear. So if you're looking for recommendations on what gear to get or you're interested in the stuff that we use and what we think about it, check them out as well. Um, again, I've linked them up here and they're in the description down below too. If you're interested in the filming process for this video, we shot everything on the Sony a7 III camera with the 24-70 f2.8 lens. We use the Rode Video Mic Pro for all our sound and the Peak Design Travel Tripod to set up all our shots. We also have the Mavic Air drone, but as we already alluded to, we were only able to use that once on this trek. If you're interested in everything that we use for our travel uh, photography and video, we've got a full blog post detailing that, uh, what we have and why we use it, so you can check that out here. And if you fancy seeing a bit more of the behind the scenes uh, of this trek, we make Instagram stories, they're all saved in the highlights, uh, so you can go and check those out on our Instagram feed, so it is at going the whole hog uh, to relive this trek. Uh, in the behind the scenes version of it. Mm -hmm. There's a lot more whinging coming, <laughs> I definitely say that. And uh, yeah, some different scenes that you didn't see in this. Mm -hmm. I think that's us covered pretty much everything that we wanted to tell you about. If you've got any questions, do leave us a comment down below or comment on the blog post if the question is not answered in there. Uh, send us an email, whatever you fancy. We hope you've enjoyed this video and that you found it useful and that you can come and do this trek for yourself sometime. If you did enjoy it, give it the old thumbs up. Uh, if you haven't subscribed to the channel, please go and do so. We really appreciate all your support. And we will see you next time on the Lagwadeki National Park three-day Black Rock Lake trek, where we had the best trail dog that we have ever had. Three days with Maggie the dog. I was heartbroken to say goodbye to her at the end. But thankfully for me and for you guys, we do have three days with Maggie to look forward to and she will always be there in the next video that's coming up soon. Thanks for watching. Thanks we'll for see you watching. Next time. See ya. Bye.